That takes a toll. But I asked God, isn't there another place? And he was silent. But this place just kept coming up. So I came back here. And it's like, well, okay, they got a pastor here, so this is cool. Maybe I can just sit and, you know, just eventually get brought in. The pastor was here for like two weeks and a half. Oh my, that's what I said. <laughs> and they offered me this position. And they told me I needed to talk with the ministerial sec secretary at the conference. And I said, okay, God, if this is what you want, I will talk with him. And if he says okay, then I know this is from you. And I talked with him. And we talked for, we talked for a while. But we talked about the church stuff for maybe 10 minutes. I'm thinking to myself, well, he's a really nice guy. Maybe this is not going real well. He doesn't know how to actually get out of this. But in the end, in the end, it's like, okay, so we're finished. And I'm looking at it and I said, well, what do you think? He goes, yeah. Um, if, this, if, if you're comfortable with this, he says, I'm comfortable with this, you can start next week. Yes. Yeah, and I've been here since it's almost 11 years ago. Okay. Amen. Uh, Pastor. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it seems that you, you describe something that a lot of us go through, especially when we're talking about uh, righteousness by faith. Because when you look in the mirror and you look at the, the, the image of yourself, isn't it easy for you to see that another person can be forgiven, but you can't? Yes. When you look at yourself? Yes. What he did, what she did is okay because God has already died on the cross. But when you look at yourself, you, you don't separate the sin from the from the sinner. Mm -hmm. and, and all you see in, in your own uh, image is something that is negative. And, and when you do that, it's almost like when they say, well, you, you cannot... It doesn't require faith to keep the law. It never did. So that's why keeping the law is, it can, cannot be considered righteousness because it doesn't require any faith. Just like love does not require judgment. Hmm. If you use love to require judgment, then we're judging ourselves and not the love that God has for us. Well, you've got to turn it around and you see that God judges all sin the same just like he judges all love the same. So if God can love this person, then he can love you. If he can forgive this person, he can forgive you. It has to be the same. Amen. Amen. So as I said, and as I read here, God is no respecter of persons, but will punish sin wherever it is found. So I want you to think about that. God is no respecter of persons. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Let's look at verses 34 and 35. Lester, can you read that for me? Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. This is when Peter went to the house of Cornelius. And he makes this statement. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Then Peter opens his mouth and said, Of the truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that fears him and worketh righteousness is accepted. So in the house of Cornelius, the apostle Peter made this statement. There are men in heathen lands who may never have heard the name of God or seen a line of his written word, but who will be saved. God is revealed in the works of creation, and they who accept what they see of him, there are accepted with him as surely as they who have learned much more of him. So the first part of the third chapter of Romans consists of questions and answers. A thoughtful reader of the epistles of Paul must have noticed the frequent occurrence of questions in the middle of an argument. Every possible objection is anticipated by Paul. The apostle asks the questions that an objector might ask, and then he answers it, making his argument more emphatic than before. So in the verses next following, it is very evident that the truth set forth in the second chapter would not be very acceptable to a Pharisee, and he would combat them with all his might. So the questions raised by the apostles, or by the apostle here, are not difficulties that lie in his own mind. This is clear from the 
parenthetical clause in verse 5 where he says, I speak as a man. So, Paul starts to go through these questions and he starts to answer them. What advantage then has the Jew? What is the prophet of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly because we're committed to that nation, what? The oracles of God. What is the oracles of God? The scriptures. Okay, now listen. An oracle is something that is spoken. What do we find in scripture that God actually spoke? Say it loud, Ricky. The Ten Commandments, when it comes to His law, right? God spoke the Ten Commandments. That is an oracle of God. And that was entrusted to the Jews. Was there profit in giving them the law? We just read that no flesh shall be saved under the law. But was there profit in them having the law? And the answer is yes. Why? Because they got a much clearer understanding of the character and the nature of God. They also should have seen their true nature. And that's where they made their mistake. Instead of the law being a mirror to them, to showing God's character and then showing them theirs, they turned the law around as a means of salvation. And they... God gave them the gospel, and they perverted the gospel into a gospel of works. So was there profit in God giving them His oracles, His law? Now not only His law, but we find, and let's turn. First turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22. This is about the oracles of God. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22. Tom, if you get that, can you read it for me? Deuteronomy chapter 5 and then verse 22. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick gloom with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. Okay, so what is this actually talking about? What event that was taking place? This was God coming down upon the mountain and actually giving his law. And it tells you here, he spoke it to the assembly, right? Yeah. So God gave this oracle, his law. Now let's look at First Peter. No, Second Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Now I'll read that. Once again, the page is stopped. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any what? Private. private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by who? So the rest of the Bible, the rest of Scripture, came through who? Is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. So the rest of your Bible is an oracle of God. Okay? So the oracles of God. Was it profitable for the nation of Israel to have these oracles? And the answer is yes. Why? Because they had the clearest understanding of who God was and the plan of salvation than any other nation on earth. They were supposed to be his missionaries for the entire world. Did they accomplish that? And the answer is no. Why? Because they chose to hide themselves from the rest of the world and to wall themselves off from them so they wouldn't be defiled instead of going into every part of the world to give the gospel. So when they failed to do that, what did God do? Was God going, what do I do now? God said, I will raise up a people who will give this gospel message. And so in the process of doing that, he took one man. One man. Can a one person change the world? Did Saul, after his conversion, 
conversion and became Paul, did he change the world? Yes. What did he do? And who did he go to? To the Gentiles, right? So did God raise up a people who will hear, accept, and proclaim the gospel? So think about what I just said and think about these verses. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. When Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and his followers were crying out and making great noise, Hosanna, Hosanna, what did the Pharisees say to him and to them? They told him to rebuke them and keep them quiet. What did Jesus say? Something really strange. Well, that right. if these stay quiet, even the very rocks will cry out. If you and I do not do what God has called us to do, God will do the same thing that he did back when Israel failed. He could make the rocks cry out if he wanted to. But he gives us the opportunity and the privilege. Do you understand? The privilege of sharing the gospel. This is what we're called for. And if we do not do that, God will make the rocks cry out. I have come to understand, submit, and allow God to use me in whatever way He deems uh, right for His will to proclaim this message. And I'm up here, right? If you would have told me I would have been up here, I would have never believed it. Now, do I have an English degree? Yeah, thank you. That's right. <laughs> do I speak really well sometimes? No. But is God able to use somebody like me? So listen, if He can use me, He can use all of you. Amen. Amen. All right. So, let me... Turn real quick to 1 Peter, if you're still in 2 Peter. Turn back to 1 Peter. Um, I think we're going to look at chapter 4, verse 11. First Peter, chapter 4, verse 11. And this still has to do with the oracles of God. Now listen, this is talking to you and me. Verse 11, if anyone speaks... Let him speak as what? The oracles. the oracles of God. What does that say? That if you want to speak, know your Bible so you know what to speak about. Don't give opinion. Don't give conjecture. If you don't know God's Word, how's God going to ever use you? But if you do know God's Word, then speak according to that word. But don't tell me what this guy said about God's word, and don't tell me what this woman said about God's word. Tell me what God's word says. Amen. Do you realize that was the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation? I don't need to hear what the priests say about God's word. I need to hear what God's word says about God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so... That was 4, verse 11. Let me continue with it. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That in all things, who may be glorified? God may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. One last thing that I'd like to share with you. There are many who think that the law of God is a burden, and they imagine that the advantage of Christians is that they have nothing to do with it. But on the contrary, John says in 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are what? Not grievous. And Paul says that the possession of the law was a great advantage to the Jew, 
So Moses said in Deuteronomy 4 8, What nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? All who truly love the Lord count it a great blessing to have God's holy law made plain to them. Is there an advantage to being a seventh day Adventist? Is there an advantage? to having an understanding of what God has shown this church? And the answer is yes, in every way. God has raised this church up so that a people can be ready to proclaim this gospel message, a true gospel message, in the midst of apostasy, hypocrisy, and darkness, so that God's truth and God's light can shine forth. But we look at Revelation Chapter 3, the last letter to the seven churches, and we find a church asleep. A church who thinks that it's rich, when actually it's poor. A church who thinks that it's clothed in great garments. Lots of gold, lots of silver, and actually they're poor, they're blind, and they're wretched. A church that God says, I would rather have you cold. I would rather have you turn your heart away from me than be a hypocrite and pretend that you love me with your mouth, but your hearts are far away. That's not this church, and that's why I'm still here. Because God has called a people to prepare them to do great things for Him. Do you realize you're those people? Do you want to be those people? Do you want to be used by Him to do great things? I do. I really want to see Jesus Christ come in the clouds of glory before I die. I don't want to go into the grave. Now I have apprehensions about that because I got a lot of loved ones that aren't saved, but I have to leave that in God's hands. And God is faithful. I have to trust Him. Do you trust Him? Closing in this morning is in number 633. <laughs>
your word has been taught in the Sabbath school class, as your word has been expounded on in the preaching part of this service, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will cut through our hardness, that truly we will have our hearts circumcised, that we'll be able to hear your voice, that through your word we will be led, that we will be more than just hearers of the word, but fathers, make us doers of the word. Father, help us to practice righteousness. Help us to put away sin. Help us to put down all of these distractions and actually take up your word and be faithful students. Father, I pray that you will open our hearts, that you will give us strength, that you will increase our faith and help us continuously fall in love with Jesus Christ. Father, because victory only comes by loving Him, knowing Him, and allowing Him to work out His will in our lives. Father, that this church may be a reflection of You, Your character, that the world will see us, but not us, but actually see Jesus. That is my prayer. God, I hope that happens. For this I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.